do 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 I'm all I wanna be do 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 a walking study do 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 demonology Look at my face. Money is never lost. So much forgotten. So glad you can make it with you. So glad you can make it now. Turtle God. All right, while we wait for other people to come in, um, a few reminders. First of all, you may have seen an email that went out yesterday or today about a, um, an alumni career panel on Friday the 26th. That'll be not this Friday, but the following at 4 p.m. It'll be on Zoom. And we're going to have um, two people there who took this class, Jatini No and Sarah Margala, and both of them are now working in the optics industry. Sarah as an engineer for Northrop and Jatini as a sales engineer. Does anybody know what a sales engineer does? Uh, kind of help provide technical information and support for like a manufacturing optics company. Um, based so well, not necessarily when, when you say for manufacturer, do you mean as the um, that the manufacturer is the client that they're selling to or that they're selling the manufacturer's stuff to someone else? The manufacturer would sell to someone else, like why their products are good, why they can make the particular lens that the client is looking for. Yeah, basically a sales engineer is not just coming up to say and when saying, Hey, how's it going? How about we get you in the new laser today? You know, it's not, it's not just slick salesmanship, although people skills are obviously important, but it's uh, someone who works with the client to understand their application and what they're really trying to do. If you just sell someone the first piece of equipment they ask for, the sad fact is that the customer is not always right. And so if you just give someone the first thing that they ask for, it might not be what they need. If you sit down with them and really try to figure out their technology and then um, go through your own catalog and figure out what would be useful for them, what parts could you customize for them, that's basically what a sales engineer does. Sometimes they're called sales engineers, applications engineers, technical sales. People who work in that field could explain the precise differences between all of those job titles. But the common theme for me as an outsider who's watched some of these people in their careers is that regardless of what the specific title is and regardless of the specifics of their company, the only way that they're going to make a sale to a client is if they really understand the client's needs and provide tech support. So that's what Jatini does. Sarah, I know less about her engineering work. I mean, defense contractors don't always tell you much about their engineering work, uh, but she'll certainly be able to talk about the skills that uh, she uses in the job, at least in general terms. Um, 
And then in March and April, we're going to have a few more alumni who have taken this class, just coming specifically to talk to this class and discuss what they do now in their jobs. One of them is, I forget whether it's sales engineer or applications engineer, but it's the same type of job at a company that makes a wide range of optical components, including he's done quite a bit of work with thin films, which we're gonna be talking about in April. Um, another one manages a metrology lab. That's the, um, that's metrology is basically the people who look at a component and make sure that it really does what they claim it does. They do quality control. I mean, it's more than that, but that would be a shorthand for it. Um, you know, somebody comes in and says, this piece has these properties, it has this focal length, it makes an image of this quality, and then they verify all of that. And they are very important as middlemen between manufacturers and uh, clients here. And then finally, another one of them is a uh, optical engineer, again, at a defense contractor. And they probably won't be able to discuss all the details of what they do, but the skills that they use, how they got into it. Um, so that's a preview of what's coming up in the next few weeks, and particularly in this class in March and April. Um, Next Thursday, not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, we're going to start using Mathematica some. Um, we'll still be using ZMAX every week, but we're also going to use Mathematica because we're going to be doing matrix optics and doing all of these matrix multiplications is much, much easier in Mathematica. Any questions on any of that? Then what I would like to start with is by taking questions on the um, latest project, because I noticed that there did seem to be quite a few questions about that. Um, I think there were a number of people who were not sure how to do various things in ZMAX. I think this assignment was conceptually simple, very theta measure, measure Y, very Y measure theta, plot F tan theta, but a lot of the technical details turned out to be harder. So ask away right now. I'm going to share my other screen where I've got um, ZMAX open. Wait, did you say we were supposed to plot F tan theta? Cause I plotted Y versus tan theta and, and use the slope to kind of- Y analyze. versus tan theta. Y okay, versus tan theta. okay, cool. I got scared a little bit, thank you. Somebody must have a question on how I did this. Somebody must have had, everybody had a problem with this in the emails I was getting all day. So somebody must have had a question they didn't ask. I have a question, but I feel like it's kind of long. So I was gonna wait. Well, go ahead and ask. <laughs> um, for the final third part telescope, um, I was wondering what, how could you set it up with, cause you kind of gave us leeway on like focal length parameters uh, and everything like that and aperture. What's the best way to go about setting it up to achieve the highest magnification? Cause I mean, I just kind of set it up, got a magnification, but as far as getting the best magnification out of a two lens system, I was wondering how you would go about doing that. Well, I asked for, 10x magnification. So I gave you the magnification. I think what you're asking about is image quality. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Yeah, let's go so, ahead. <laughs> some of that is going to some of that is going to come up in the next project. Um, in the next project, you're going to have two plano convex lenses, and if oops. If that's what we want to talk. So some of the, that is going to come up with the next project where we have two plano convex lenses. And of course, if you got two plano convex lenses for each one, the flat side could be on the left or right. So there's two possible configurations for the first lens, two possible configurations for the second lens. You have to see which one is best. And this Thursday, we're going to start talking about aberration theory. So you will get some sense 
of uh, which might be best or some sense of how to figure out which would be best. I mean, other than just looking at it and seeing what gives the smallest image size, but you will also get a sense of why is one configuration better. Um, we can go into that a little bit more in a minute, but for now, one thing I wanna talk about to kind of motivate what we're gonna start on Thursday with aberration theory, you should have noticed that if you have fairly small field angles like this, you get a pretty well-focused off-axis image, but you know it's definitely not focused at the same place where it would be if it was closer to the axis. If we keep doing a quick focus, you probably found that, okay, if I put both of them, well, let's even just go all the way, put both of them on axis, all right? And here's where it focuses. Then I change the uh, position, the field angle. And it looks like it's a little bit deceptive, but not entirely deceptive. It looks like it's actually focused over here, but it's really not focused all the way there. And the way to see that is we're just looking at a cross section right now. Let's go to a 3D shaded model. And I'm bad at manipulating these 3D things. It's even worse with the, uh, okay, let's zoom in. No. Yeah, so when you look at this, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, when you look at this from different angles, I'm gonna turn that off. Um, no, I'm going to, that's not a big, uh, what do I want? I don't want the annotation. Okay, to drag and freely rotate. What you should see is that it's definitely out of focus, but where it's the beam waist is thinnest over here from this angle, it looks like it's right up there. But then as we turn it, it's not at all clear, okay? And it seems to be moving, the position seems to be moving as we turn it. And that's further exemplified if we go into the spot diagram where instead of looking at it from the side, we're looking at it head on and you see that the image is highly asymmetric. Now, if we do a quick focus, it changes slightly. I'll zoom out there. But then as I change it more, like to say 25, okay, that's just clearly out of focus. And if I do a quick focus, it brings it, well, whoa. It brings it in like that. So we can see that the focal length is clearly changing as we move the object off axis. Um, I wanted you to see that in this assignment. We'll discuss why it is on Thursday. And then next Tuesday, what I want you to do is I want you to actually look at, it won't be for this kind of situation, it'll be for a different kind of situation. I want you to play with the aperture and just see what happens. If I go from 2.5 aperture to 0 0.5 and then redo the focus, the spot size, well, for the off axis, it's just terrible no matter what because we're so far off axis. If I were closer on axis and I did a quick focus, then you would see that as we change the aperture size, 
It looks to the eye like it jumped. It looks to the eye like it got bigger, but that's because it changes the scale on this. If I first do 0 0.5, the RMS radius is 7.07. .07. If I do 0 0.2, the um, RMS radius is 2.8 instead of 7.07. .07. So it's actually getting smaller. It's just that it's rescaling the graphics. And you're going to see what is the quantitative trend in that. So you're going to be setting up some on an on-axis object in a system of lenses, playing with the aperture, and seeing what the quantitative trend is. Any questions? Uh, Professor, I have a question um, that is like about the telescope portion of it. Okay. Um, so for when we're trying to find the um, the theta of image, were we supposed to use the full field um spot diagram to use it? Because I just found it via trig. All right. So there were there were a couple of ways you could do it. Um, sometimes this spot diagram doesn't read out correctly. I don't know why. I've played with it. Um, I mean, if I look at the layout here, this angle is way more than 0 0.48 degrees. If they said that this is 0 0.48 radians, that would be correct. So I don't always know what's going on there. The full field spot diagram, I would just read it out there. I would just go to the center of the image, zoom in on it and say, okay, the center of the image is at minus 27.6, roughly 27.58 degrees. And let's see what that is in radians. Uh, so I have my calculator there. Twenty seven point five eight times three point one four divided by one eighty is about zero point four eight. So for some reason it was reading out radians but printing the, the symbol degrees. And I confess I haven't entirely figured out. That's the easiest way to do it though, is to just look on here and then maybe do trig once or twice to verify that things are consistent but I wouldn't necessarily do trig every time. That would be hard. But of course, trig will give you the answer. I mean, you certainly can figure out what angle these rays are going at. I'm not gonna take off points for doing trigonometry and getting the correct angle. Yeah, so um, my my problem with the full field spot diagram is I, I changed the units um, for the afocal mode to degrees, uh -huh. but um, I think it was displaying it as like microns or something like that. So it wouldn't it wouldn't change units. So that's why I just relied on trig instead. So it may have been that you didn't have an afocal image space. All right, if we don't have an afocal image space, then our spot diagram, I mean, it's trying to read off, it's trying, it's saying, okay, well, the, uh, the last layer thickness was infinity and it's going out to as many digits as it can go out. And it's saying, all right, if I go out that many digits, the rays have spread out by many, 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 many centimeters. Um, it's saying that here is, you know, you move like one pixel and you've changed by uh, 10 to the eighth um, or so, 10 to the 10th uh, centimeters or microns, sorry, 10 to the 10th microns, which would be 10 to the fourth meters, which would be 10 to the six centimeters. So, you know, it's, it's moving quite a bit. Um, so 
a focal image space is not what you want. You want, sorry, a focal image space is what you want. If you have an infinitely thick layer and you don't use an a focal image space, a focal image space just means it's not looking for something focused. It's not looking for how far apart two rays are on a surface that they hit. It's looking at the angle between two rays. That's what you want. Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. Uh, when you had your a focal image space off, I had the exact same thing. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, when I was doing um, the second part of the project and I was looking at the uh, full spot diagram, yeah, the full field spot diagram, every time like I would increase my Y a little bit, um, the like the cross section of the off axis light rays would get wider and wider and they would like turn into a parabola. So I kind of just like guesstimated where I believed the sensor would be. Like, would there be, is there a better way of measuring that angle instead of eyeballing it? When this is working, and it's clearly not working now, but when this is working, minus 27 point whatever degrees is about minus 0.48 radians. When this is working, it will display the correct um it will display the correct number i really don't know why it's sometimes displaying these things incorrectly and when it's not doing that there's two things you can do one is here's what i would honestly do i would look at this number here and ask myself could it be that it has the wrong units but i wouldn't assume it has the wrong units i wouldn't say oh that must be radians because if I say that must be radians, I'm going to probably get, it, I, I could get it wrong. I say it could be radians. It could just be that for some reason, there's some bug that's not displaying the units correctly. You know, it's basically doing a freshman lab report and getting all of its units wrong. And um, then I would say, well, let's convert degrees to radians and see if that works. And then I might say, okay, well, it worked in that case. You know, we already ran that one through the calculator. So then I might try another value of y. And, you know, bring it in halfway. And I would say, well, okay, I brought it in halfway. And now the angle is about minus 14.8. And my spot diagram is saying again that the, um, and so the angle roughly halved, and this number here roughly halved. It still has the wrong units, but it got cut in half. So I know how to read it out. It would be like if you're in freshman lab and the LCD on the ohmmeter or on the multimeter is broken. So you can't see whether the readout is currently volts or millivolts or whatever but based on everything else you know about the circuit that you're working on, it would make total sense if this, if this measurement is seven volts, it would not make sense for it to be seven millivolts in this situation, then you might just go with that. But you'd have to check, you'd have to think, you'd not just say, oh, I'm just gonna guess. You'd have to say, well, if it is volts, based on everything I know about the circuit, based on what's coming out of the power supply based on what resistors I have where and what currents I've measured is seven volts reasonable. Likewise here, I look at the diagram and I say 0.25, a quarter of a radian would be about 14 degrees. 14 degrees looks halfway reasonable. We might do some trigonometry, you know, see, okay, well, here's y equals roughly zero or v equals roughly zero. And here in the middle of the bundle is v equals minus 2.7. And this distance from here to here is from 10 to um, one. So, you know, I could do some, I could do an, art, an inverse tangent on that. That's how I would do these things. Other questions? The one thing you never wanna do is say, 
the computer like was like confusing. So I stopped thinking because if we stop thinking as soon as computers are confusing, then computers will reenact Battlestar Galactica on us someday. And the machines will rise up against the humans. And I really don't want to be stuck on a spaceship with President Gaius Baltar. Anyway, I guess Battlestar Galactica is old now. Other questions? Okay, then let's talk about quantifying the amount of light collected. Last time, we were discussing a scenario where we've got some sort of detector and we've got a source that is whatever distance away along the axis, some distance X away. And we determine that it's making an angle theta and it's hitting a circle of radius R. And we said that the power collected wound or the per percentage of power collected is equal to one minus cosine alpha over two. And then we noted that this was sine squared alpha over two. Does that look familiar? And we got that by remembering that if we've got a point source here, the, po the power is P. And so the intensity is P over four pi R squared. And the actual flux of power per unit area is going to be, if we've got an element DA here, then I DA cosine of theta, oh wait, this one, should be alpha. Alpha is the outermost angle. And this would be theta, so this would be theta. And theta is the angle between the normal to the surface and the ray of light. And IDA cosine theta is equal to the differential element of power. And so we integrated over the entire surface. And that is the total collected power. Any questions on that? Um, professor, so you said the fraction of power um, collected is sine squared uh, or sine alpha over two squared. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why in, in my notes, I have P over two times sine um, alpha over two squared. Does that, may I just wrote it wrong or does that? There may, um, you may have written it wrong being, being rushed for time at the end. I may have said something wrong. But let's put it this way. Here's how we can check that formula, all right? The way we can check that formula is we could ask ourselves, what if alpha is 180 degrees, okay? If alpha is 180 degrees, then we are collecting light across a circle. Right? We're collecting everything. And there are people who make things, they're called integrating spheres. You put a specimen inside the sphere, then 
Of course, there are practical things. You got to put a little door on there to open. And so there's going to be places where you can't put light detectors, but you put light detectors all over as much of it as possible. And they do this for collecting light from really faint specimens. Okay. Well, leaving aside the fact that the integrating sphere isn't perfect, we should be collecting 100% of the light. And so our angle would be, we'd go from here to there, alpha would be 180 degrees, because we'd also be going that way. Remember that in this experiment, this would be minus alpha. So alpha is the maximum angle away from the center. The real range would be two alpha. But let's see here, sine squared, 180 degrees over two would be sine squared 90 degrees. And the sine of 90 degrees is one, so this would be one. On the other hand, Kenneth, your formula had a one half in it. And so that formula would say that we only get half the light, even when we surround it with detectors in every single possible direction. So that formula can't be right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I need to learn how to um, take notes again. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, well, okay, yes, you know, of course, taking good notes is good. But the most, the most useful thing that I learned from my freshman physics professor was how to check your work. What he said he would do is that he would plug in zero and 90 degrees or 180 degrees and check his work that way. Any formula that involved angles, he'd plug in zero and or 90 and or 180 and maybe occasionally 45, but he'd just plug in a couple of angles and ask himself, does this answer make any sense? And you know, he was, it was freshman physics, we were doing mechanics. And if the answer he got was that the acceleration of something going straight down, you know, if it's a, like an inclined plane problem, okay? And he's trying to remember whether the component of acceleration is sine or cosine. He'd say, well, you know, if it was not uh, an incline, but a cliff, of course it's gotta go right down at the acceleration of gravity. And if it's on flat ground, it better not be spontaneously accelerating at all. And then he'd ask himself, which one is gonna give zero acceleration when theta is zero? And which one is going to give G, 9.8 meters per second squared, when theta is 90 degrees. That's how he would check these things. That is a lesson from freshman physics I use every day. And then my first year of grad school, I was reminded that I cannot afford to forget that lesson. The professor had just derived some very elaborate formula for the um, relativistic Doppler shift. And then he said that this reduces to the, um, that this reduces to the classical, to the non-relativistic form in um, the limit of very small velocities. And I said that there was something about that formula that didn't look like it. So then he just pulled out a Taylor series and boom, showed me I'm wrong, that it does in fact reduce. And the lesson was that you still have to check your work and you have to know your Taylor series. And this is worth harping on, even in applied optics, because all physics classes, all technical work are about problem solving and troubleshooting and checking calculations. And it's all, all fundamentals. I'll say one more thing as long as I'm off on a rant, which is that over the past several days on the internet, there's been some controversy over some stupid workshop somewhere where some idiot tried to say, oh, you know, when you're teaching math, you, you shouldn't focus on whatever. They had a list of things that you shouldn't focus on. This is their K through 12. And they're like, oh, you, you know, we should focus on being more creative and seeing the big picture. Fundamentals are everything. Fundamentals are every single thing. I have heard that there are many Nobel laureates out there who make a point of constantly rereading key books from their school days. 
I heard a biology Nobel laureate say that he still reviews his freshman chemistry book every day because he just does not want to forget the most basic facts. Now, of course, his idea of which facts are relevant is completely different from a freshman's. He's seen, you know, he's reading it for, he's looking for different things. He's refreshing himself on different points than a freshman would, but he's still refreshing himself. I heard that one of the, that it was one of the two guys involved in parity violation, probably Lee, maybe Yang, still does problems from the textbook he used in his first year of graduate school. Every single day he does a problem from the textbook he used in his first book year of graduate school. And it's the same reason why the most elite military units, granted, you know, who knows for sure what they do, but in all of the publicly informa available information that they've ever given out, they don't talk about, I mean, you could say, well, they can't talk about for secrecy. They don't talk about really super elaborate maneuvers and skills. You know, I'm sure somebody's learning how to hack into electronic locks with the latest tech or whatever, but mostly they talk about doing push-ups and running because it's all fundamentals. Every hard endeavor in life is fundamentals. Every single hard endeavor is fundamentals. So yeah, that's how I check. Whenever you see me in class say, no, wait, that can't be right. It's because even while I'm talking, part of my brain is three steps ahead saying, wait, if I plug in theta equals zero here, I'm getting something wrong. Rather than getting there, I better back up now. All right, so where were we? What we found was that in this case, the fraction of power collected just depended on the angle. And that is a, maybe at first glance a little bit surprising because the intensity certainly depends on distance. But the light is spreading out in all directions. And so regardless of how close or far this is, if I took another um, detector that was smaller but put it closer, I'm still intercepting the same fraction of the light. If I put it farther away, I would still be intercepting the same fraction of the light as long as I made it bigger, all right? So ultimately what matters here is that the fraction of light collected only depended on this angle alpha, all right? It only depends on alpha. And I wanna talk about why that is by doing this calculation another way. So let's, Imagine that instead of having a, um, a flat surface, we had a circular detector, like the integrating sphere, okay? So all of the light is hitting head on. The only question we have to ask ourselves is, since we know that I D A I D A cosine theta is just I D A because the angle, you know, if we draw the perpendicular to the surface there, the angle between that perpendicular and the surface is zero. The, the angle between that perpendicular and the ray hitting the surface is zero. And if we did a head-on view of it, we would be looking at a little segment carved out of a spherical surface. So what we're doing is an angle in polar coordinates, okay? We're calculating something called the solid angle. Omega is the solid angle. And the way to think about solid angle is, let's go back to how we measure an angle in radians. Say, well, we measure an angle in radians just by, um, you know, measuring in degrees and multiplying by pi over 180. Well, sure, but the whole idea of measuring it in radians came from the fact that if I've got a circle of radius r and I'm looking at a little segment of it, this arc length s over here is going to be 
the circumference times the fraction of the circle covered, or it's going to be two pi r times theta over two pi. The two pi's cancel, so we're left with r theta. Well, now if we were to, and here I'll try to draw like looking at some segment in sort of a perspective view, or to try to um, view that. Imagine that we're looking more head on here. This is like a cap on it, all right? Omega would be A over R squared, all right? Theta is S over R, omega is A over R squared. That's how solid angle is defined. So the maximum possible value of theta is two pi. What do you think the maximum solid angle must be? What would be the shape that covers all of the possible solid angle? Uh, a yeah. hollow sphere. Sphere, yeah. Right. Sphere covers the maximum possible solid angle omega. A is four pi r squared. So A over r squared is four pi r squared over r squared or just four pi, right? That's why when you see those spherical coordinates integrals they will often, instead of, you, know, you can write a sine theta, d theta, d phi, sometimes people will write them as the integral of d omega, right? And well, if I'm looking at this head on, I can never somehow draw that in, all right? Phi is the angle going around like this. So that's zero to two pi. This is alpha. So our limits of integration will be from phi equals zero to two pi, from theta equals zero to alpha. All right, we're gonna see how much solid angle we cover here. Which of these integrals, we got two integrals to do. Which of these is the easiest? The uh, phi. Yeah, because there's no phi in the integrand. So the integral of d phi is just two pi. And let's see here. The derivative of minus cosine is sine. zero to alpha, excuse me. So we get minus two pi times cosine alpha minus cosine of zero, which is one, or two pi times one minus cosine alpha. So the solid angle covered is this. So the fraction of all possible solid angle is equal to that over four pi. Because we established, <clears throat> we established above that uh, the maximum solid angle is four pi since it's area over r squared. Any questions?
we derived the same fact two different ways. Feynman said you don't understand something until you can derive it two or three different ways. If you only know how to derive something one way, you don't understand it. He also said that we don't really understand something unless he can explain it to sophomores. And he was pretty sure he didn't understand the difference between fermions and bosons because he couldn't explain it to sophomores. But then later in his book, it's a transcript of a public lecture, later in a public lecture that got written up in a book called Elementary Particles and the Laws of Physics, he proceeded to explain the difference, sort of explain the difference between fermions and bosons at a popular level. You could still ask, it involves this trick with an angle and you could still ask, okay, but why does that trick with an angle even apply to these particles? And then you have to say uh, more advanced math, but we'll leave that aside for another time. Okay, so the amount of light collected is given by, is it only depends on the, um, the acceptance angle. And many people, rather than just reporting an acceptance angle, will instead report something called a numerical aperture. Which is N sine alpha. And N and alpha are both measured in the same medium. There's two reasons to take side, rather than just saying alpha equals this many degrees, tell you N sine alpha. There's an, there's an obvious one, and then there's one that we haven't discussed yet. But can anybody think about the obvious one from what we have discussed? Anyone? I'm sorry, the obvious what? There's an obvious reason to report N sine alpha instead of just reporting alpha, instead of saying alpha is however many degrees. Why would people choose to report N sine alpha? Uh, because of the medium we're working with. Go on. Why does the medium matter? Uh, the index of refraction uh, varies, I don't know, with the wavelength of the light. Okay, well, why is index of refraction a natural thing to include alongside a measure of angle? Um, principle of least time? Yeah, you're, you're making this harder than it needs to be. Uh, I don't know, Snell's Law? <laughs> Snell's Law. Okay. <laughs> because that's how data is the same in all media, all right? Because let's imagine, here's a very important situation. Let's say we've got tissue, then we've got a cover slip, all right? Or we might have actually tissue. It could be in contact with, a, yeah, tissue in contact with the cover slip. And then we've got oil, that sometimes happens. And then we've got glass. There are reasons why people use high index oils with glass, All right? So here's a situation that might happen. People don't usually do the, you know what, let's, let's do, doesn't, you know, let's, I, I wanna be realistic. Yeah, let's be realistic here. Okay, so we're gonna have tissue, then we're gonna have some kind of liquid outside the tissue. Then we're going to have our cover slip, then maybe air, and then we're going to have glass. Well, the light was collected from, and I'm drawing it in red because tissue is more transparent to red. Anybody who's ever uh, shined a flashlight through their hand knows that fact. So that's not just a piece of trivia. People spend a lot of money trying to make near infrared optics for biology. So the angle is going to change from one medium to the next. Uh, the angle might get larger or smaller depending on the, the index of the medium. It'll probably get much smaller here and so forth. But N sine theta will be the same everywhere. But that's not the only reason why people report that because 
honestly, it would be better to know the angle and the refractive index. There are different calculations where one or the other might be needed, but not, or maybe both, but instead of needing n sine theta, you need n squared cosine alpha or something, whatever. There's another reason, which we haven't gone to yet, but it turns out that the smallest thing that you can see with an ordinary microscope has size 0 0.6 times the wavelength of light over n sine alpha. And it's not because of Snell's law. It's because of something involving the angles that waves spread out at. And when the waves spread out at a particular angle, that determines how large or small of a spot they make. I could go one step further and connect it to Snell's law, but it's an indirect connection. Depending on time, we may or may not go there in about a month. But that's the numerical aperture. And I'm talking about it now because oftentimes when someone is talking about a piece of optics, they won't say it has a collection angle of, I don't know, 30 degrees. They'll say it has an NA of 0 0.5. They'll just say NA equals 0 0.5. That's just the way they talk. And it's because of these two facts. Any questions so far? Um, could you clarify again, what is that 0. 0.6 lambda? You said that's the smallest. Spot size, the smallest spot size a lens can focus light to. Now, there are, there are some caveats on that. There are tricks that people have used for certain situations. Just about all of those tricks involve doing things that cause bigger problems. Not just, oh, it means you need an expensive laser or expensive lens, or you need to, you know, run some sort of elaborate cooling system because the power supply is so big and overheated. No, it's, it has to do with the way that some of the light gets distributed out. That in short, when people focus light, normally we say that, all right, the light gets focused to a size of spot, the spot of size 0 0.6 lambda over the numerical aperture. So there are, we, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. So the limiting um, factor, is this where we, is this where you'd start talking about diffraction limit then? Yeah, that's the diffraction limit. Okay. Now, some, some people will say, oh, I can focus. There are ways to focus light smaller. Okay. The problem is that you wind up with these big side lobes, which means that if all you really care about is the light in this region, great. But if you care about the overall distribution of light, if those side lobes are gonna cause problems in your experiment, you haven't really confined the light to this region. You've confined a tiny fraction of the light to this region at the cost of not only wasting photons, whatever, turn up the power, you can buy some cooling apparatus for it. Um, but you've now put light where you don't want it. If you were trying to say, do lithography and drive a chemical reaction in one particular spot, well, that's a problem. Or if you're doing fluorescence microscopy and all you wanna do is excite fluorescence from here and see what happens. Well, now you've also got a bunch of signal coming from over there. So there are all sorts of very fundamental optical problems with things like this. But people continue to work on that and I've seen some very clever work and I have a few of my own ideas, but in general, it is safe to say that you should not count on a lens producing anything smaller than that. So I'm guessing um, if you consider this, uh, you know, that, that smaller focus with the inefficient light distribution, it would affect, I guess, the resolution of what you want to focus on? It would affect the resolution if the signal coming from over here is also going to go into your detector, which okay. it probably will. Yeah, I see. Okay, uh, I guess another question. 
Uh, so if you were to, because uh, you were you were just mentioning about how there are methods to I don't know work with stuff like this, uh, mm -hmm. would that also be like algorithm based? Oh, we can see things smaller than the wavelength of light. We can't focus light smaller, but we can see things smaller than the wavelength of light. You've been reading about super resolution. So yes, believe me, we can see things smaller than the wavelength of light. Anyone who says you can't use light to see things smaller than about half the wavelength has not been paying attention to physics for the last 15 years, okay? They like, they, they you know, Basically, the cicada, let's put it this way. When the cicadas wake up this summer, they're going, you know, the 17-year cicadas. Oh, you're right. It is 2021. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. There were uh, there were cicadas. There was apparently a big group of cicadas that went to sleep in 2014. Sorry, 2004. When the cicadas wake up this summer, we're going to have to tell them that the diffraction limit has been overcome. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll read more. I'll read more. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Then let's do a few example calculations and then we'll take a break and then we'll talk about uh, pixel size. So let's say we've got a circular detector. With a three centimeter diameter. Circular detector three centimeter diameter. How far away would we have to go to get 10% of the light? How far from a point source? Any ideas on how to do that? Like uh, how we could set up. How do we how do we do the calculation to figure out how far away we should be? So here's um, our point source. Doesn't that depend? Uh, we can recall intensity, right? Yeah, so the intensity is P over four pi R squared. And we've got a detector over here, some distance away. I'm going to say that this is three centimeters. So this is 1.5 centimeters. And we have to figure out what is this distance here so that our detector is getting 10% of the light. Uh, I don't know if I really get the question because uh, can't we just use the that formula regarding- That's what I wanted to hear. We can use that formula. <laughs> One minus cosine alpha over two is 0 0.1. So one minus cosine alpha is 0 0.2. Cosine alpha is 0 0.8. And this is one of the few angles other than 30, 60, 45, 90, yada, yada, that I know. And I know it because in special relativity, spend a lot of time using the fact that 0 0.6 squared plus 0 0.8 squared equals one, right? In special relativity homework problems, everything either goes at 0.6 times the speed of light or 0.8 times the speed of light because the calculations are easy with that. So sine alpha is 0 0.6, all right? So tan alpha, is 0 0.6 over 0 0.8 is 0 0.75. So what that means is that this is 1.5 centimeters and this is 
alpha, this is x, and tan alpha equals three fourths equals 1.5 centimeters over x. So x is equal to four times 1.5 centimeters over three or two centimeters. Any questions? And for what it's worth, alpha is 36.9 degrees. But the key thing is that the cosine is 0.8, the sine is 0.6. All right, now let's say that our point source produces 10 to the fourth photons per second. How long would we have to wait to get 200 photons? How long? Any guesses? How would we do this? Um, we can, I've done a problem like this before, uh, related with don't you just divide them because one's the number and the other's the rate for time? Ah, but is our detector getting 10 to the fourth photons per second? Oh, are we accounting for that 10% uh, also? The same problem? Yeah, I should rephrase this, emitted by, because I suppose from source, you could say, well, is the detector getting that many from the source or just the whole world is getting that many from the source? So that's a fair point. So 10 to the fourth photons per second are emitted by the source. Oh, well then can't we just apply what Diego suggested, but um, yeah. also ensure that our, the detector is only you know, collecting 10% of that. So the detector gets 10 to the third photons per second. And so we would just take 200 photons divided by 1,000 photons per second, and that would be equal to 0 0.2 seconds. Okay, finally. Different scenario. Sunlight is about 10 to the third watts per square meter at, the, at ground level. Yes, it depends on how hazy the sky is and everything, but that's, that's a good estimate, about 10 to the third, all right? We have a lens. And um, we have a lens with a two centimeter radius. No, sorry, a lens diameter well, let me let me just start over. We have an object, a small object. with a uh, two centimeter radius. So four centimeter diameter. Sunlight hits it. Okay. 
Then, two meters away, somebody has a very good lens that's receiving whatever light was scattered by this thing. All right, so this lens is receiving light. And the lens diameter is 10 centimeters. It's two meters away. What is the power received by the lens? And let's treat this, let's approximate this as a point source. Because it's four centimeters across, but it's 200 centimeters away. So how are we going to figure out the power that the, um, that the lens receives? Um, professor, can we use the um, equation of the intensity equals power over four pi and then L squared plus R squared? L squared plus R squared. Oh, that's, that's what I wrote in my notes. <laughs> um, that would be the power on a single point in, that would be the intensity at a single point on the lens and we could integrate over the lens. So yes, if we were to, if what you're probably thinking of is a scenario like this. If this is L and this distance up here is R, then yes, the intensity right there is indeed P over four pi times, I'll call this distance S. S squared and S is the hypotenuse of a triangle. So it is P over four pi times little r squared plus L squared. All that is true. But what's the power? First of all, what's the power emitted by the source? So you've got this object here. What is the power of the sunlight reflected by it? Assume it's a white object reflecting everything. It's the same power of the sun. If it's the if power, it's reflect the entire power of the sun or the fraction of the power of the sun that's hitting that object okay so how much power is hitting the object uh i would assume it'd be the power of the sun times however big that not times 26 the power of the sun is like what 10 to the 26 or 20, 10 to the 30 i don't know some ungodly number of watts 10 to the 30th watts or even 10 to the 26 watts is not hitting this thing. I think you mean the intensity of the sunlight. Yeah, sorry. So 10 to the third watts per meter squared times pi times two centimeters squared equals 10 to the third watts per meter squared times three over four, sorry, um, blah, times three times four times, well, two centimeters squared, you get the four and a square centimeter, that's 10 to the minus two meters, whole thing squared. So we get, 12 times 10 to the third times 10 to the minus four watts because the meters here cancel the uh, inverse meter squared there. So that is 10 to the minus four times 10 to the minus three is 0 0.1. So we get 12 watts times 0 0.1 or 1.2 watts. Now, Kenneth suggested that we take the intensity at this point on the lens and add up the intensity at some other point on the lens and add up the intensity at some other points. That would amount to doing an integral. We could, but we already did the integral. 
and we got an answer. We got that the fraction of the power received is this. So what we need to know is alpha. Okay, that's the, so the power emitted by the object is this, if it's completely white. That is 1.2 watts times one minus cosine alpha over two. All right, how are we gonna figure out alpha? Uh, I was thinking about using some trig because we know how far it is. So we know that length and then we know how big the lens is. So we have a triangle right there. Can, can we do like um, tangent of alpha over two equals Tangent of alpha over two, this is just, what, where's the one half coming from? It's just gonna be, that's alpha. Oh, then sorry, yeah. I, I was, I thought that alpha was from the top of the lens to the bottom. No. But yeah, so then tangent alpha equals the radius of the lens over how far it is, right? Yep. Equals um, 0 0.02. Okay, now I said that this is sine squared alpha over two. And we're going to use the fact that for angles less than about 0.1 radians, tan alpha equals sine alpha equals alpha. All right. So if tan alpha equals 0 0.025, Alpha is about 0 0.025. So alpha over two is about 0 0.0125 or 1.25 times 10 to the minus two radians. And then we just have to square that. So sine squared alpha over two is about 1.25 times 10 to the minus two whole thing squared, which is about 1.25 squared is roughly 1.5. So we get 1.5 times 10 to the minus four. And we multiply that by 1.2 watts we get about 1.8 times 10 to the minus four watts. Not a lot, but you know, that's like a very, that would be like if you took a laser pointer and then shined it through something that blocks 90% of the light. Most laser pointers are just a few milliwatts. So if you took a laser pointer and shined it through something that blocks 90% of the light, you'd still see something definitely very visible. That's what it is. Any questions? Then let's take a break for 10 minutes. Sound good?
All right, we'll get started in a minute. Okay, reconnect my writing tablet. All right, now we're going to ask what seems like a simple question, but is actually complicated. Is a big lens diameter going to give you a sharper picture? And let's leave aside the issue of the diffraction limit right now, which we'll get to in a few weeks. But does a wider lens give a better picture? The short answer is yes and no. Which doesn't mean like, well, whatever, man, it doesn't matter, nothing matters. No, things matter, it's just, a, it's a little bit complicated. Um, the total light collected goes up without any question. Total light collection goes up. Um, however, when you get a wider diameter lens, if all you do is take the lens you've already got and just open the um, entrance pupil wider, well, that has advantages and disadvantages. It gives you more light. It can give you, in principle, better resolution. It can also give you worse depth of field. But let's say then the question was not whether I should open up the lens I've got as wide as possible, but should I take a really big lens, or should I take a really small lens, okay? And it turns out, perhaps surprisingly, that a lot of the answer depends on something called the F number. I'm not the person who decided that F with a pound sign or number sign or hashtag subscript would be the F number, but that's what they call it. They also call it F number. And it's defined as the focal length over the diameter. This is another way of measuring the uh, light collection, but it's a little bit different than numerical aperture because numerical aperture depends entirely on the setup of your system and where you've decided to put your object. Okay, and people design lenses for different working distances. It's not, people don't always put the object at the focal length. I mean, I know that's a, that's a temptation. You might say, well, isn't the focal point like where you focus on? Well, sometimes if the detector is really far away on the other side, you know, if you've got, this is your object distance S1, well then S2 is gonna be way over there, way far away. So the focal point is not always what you focus on. So in general, the, numer the numerical aperture is not given via tan alpha equals focal equals, sorry, D over two over the focal length. And you can say, well, this is D over two and then this is alpha and this is F. There's no guarantee of that. There's absolutely no guarantee that that lens was designed to have the object exactly one focal length away and optimize the imaging on the other side. But the F number is a much more objective parameter. The F number, you don't have to ask, what was it designed for? You just say, what's the focal length? What's the diameter? Boom, you've got your F number. Now, to see how this plays out. Let's assume, we'll start by assuming that we have an object that's pretty far away. The fact that the object is far away, 
said, okay, I draw my optic axis, put my object right here. I collect light. Now the intensity, if we call this distance S1, strictly speaking, the intensity up here is different from the intensity here, which is different from the intensity here, which is different from the intensity there. But if it's really far away, as we learned on that very first assignment, these different distances aren't really all that different from each other, okay? These different distances are all pretty much the same. And so, I'm just going to approximate the intensity on here as I is roughly P over four pi S1 squared, right? And you can ask, is that a valid approximation? Well, it's a valid approximation as long as the small angle approximation is good. And the way to see that is that the area will be pi r squared or pi times d over two squared. And so i times a is p over four pi s one squared times pi d squared over four, right? And we do some canceling, cancel a pi, and we are left with P D squared over 16 S one squared. So the fraction of light is D squared over 16 S one squared. Now, what if we had used, we derived an exact formula earlier, right? We said that the fraction of light should be equal to one my, or roughly, or it should be equal to sine squared alpha over two. Okay, well, let's see, so this is alpha. What's tan alpha in terms of the variables up here? Anyone? Uh, the radius of the lens over S1. Yep, I'm gonna write that in terms of the, okay. Well, if this is a small angle, if this is small, so don't say, professor, can we always make the small, can we always use that formula that you're about to use? No, we can use it if, not always. If small alpha, then alpha should be D over two S1. Alpha over two should be D over four S1. Sine alpha over two should be D over four S1 because that's the essence of the small angle approximation. So sine squared alpha over two should be D squared over 16 S1 squared, which is the same fraction we got up here. Okay, so that's the amount of light collected. That's the fraction of the light collected so far. And clearly the wider the lens, the uh, better, the more light we're going to collect. But now we have to ask another question. We have to ask the question, how much light per pixel, okay? Because ultimately, and this was also true uh, back when people were doing things with film, you would have to ask how much light per grain of silver, okay? Because that will determine what just happened. That will determine the uh, rate of all the chemical reactions. So you could ask how much light per grain of silver halide in the film. That was the chemical they used in the film. At one time I could explain that chemistry, but I've forgotten a whole bunch of it by now. So whether it's how much light per grain of silver halide or how much light per uh, pixel, that's what matters, right? 
total light collected is P D squared over 16 S one squared. All right, now this light, well, the image, you tell me, the uh, object is really far away from the lens. That's why we were able to use a small angle approximation. So how far away from the lens will the image form? Uh, is that a question to us? <laughs> How far away from the lens? Where on the other side of the lens is the image going to form? Is that the focal length, right? If yep. the object, okay. Because S1 is going to infinity. So S2 is going to the focal length. Okay, now, fine. So the image is going to be somewhere in this plane. And I can draw that better. All right, well, let's figure out, to figure out how much light per pixel, one thing we have to ask is how big is our image in the first place? And for that, we have to start talking about the angular size of the object, okay? That's how you would ultimately measure the size of a distant object. It's angular size. Now you can say, well, of course, the distant object has a linear dimension. You know, it's however many meters or centimeters or whatever across. Yeah, but if I took something twice as big and I moved it twice as far away to my camera, it would look exactly the same. My camera has no way of knowing whether it's looking at something that's a thousand focal lengths away and a centimeter tall. Well, a centimeter wouldn't be very good. A thousand focal lengths away and a meter tall or 2000 focal lengths away and two meters tall. 2000 focal lengths, 1000 focal lengths, they're both infinity as far as the camera is concerned. So we have to look at the angular size. And I know that one didn't really go through the focal point. But this size here should be y equals F tan theta, all right? So the area, if for simplicity, this was a circle, the area should be pi y squared. If it was really a circle and was going like that, the area should be, I wrote that as r, but it should be pi y squared because Y is the radius of the thing. So pi Y squared. So that should be pi F squared tan squared theta. Okay, we keep going back and forth between intensities and powers. We had the power emitted by the object, that was P. Then we've got the power collected by the lens. But now I'm gonna take that and figure out an intensity in the focal plane. Because before we can figure out the power per pixel, we better know the power per area. Cause you know, this thing may be spreading across many pixels. So we're gonna have to figure out the area to figure out how many pixels are covered. And then once we know how many pixels are covered, we could say, all right, well, we, you know, we spread the power over this area. And then I multiply, and that's an intensity. And I multiply the intensity in that plane by the area of a pixel, and I finally get the power per pixel. So the intensity in the focal plane is equal to PD squared over 16 S1 squared divided by an area 
which is pi squared f squared tan squared theta. So that's p d squared over all bunch of things. 16 pi squared s1 squared f squared tan squared theta. Somebody must have a question at this point. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? This is all crystal clear. This is as clear as the moment of clarity that Bueller's friend had at the end of the movie. Okay. All right, so that's the intensity in that plane. We don't yet know the power per pixel. To figure out the power on one pixel, Well, that's intensity in our focal plane times A squared, where A squared, A is the pixel size. So if we take a side view, you know, if I were to go out like this, we've got a whole bunch of little squares of size A in this focal plane, okay? Each of these little squares, side length A, and that's a pretty good approximation of a pixel for now. If you were at the stage, and I'm sure there's somebody out there who's done this, where you're actually caring about the little edge effects in the pixel, and that there's somebody somewhere out there who's done that, but it's not some, it's not a type of work that I'm aware of anyone spending much time on. But for our purposes, we would just say, okay, so when I put all this together, the power per pixel is equal to P over 16 pi squared. Actually, I'm gonna rewrite it. P over four pi S1 squared times F squared, sorry. d squared over f squared times one over four pi times a squared over tan squared theta. And what you notice is that it doesn't actually depend only on the focal length or only on the diameter, but this is one over the f number squared. So here's the intensity from the image. Here's the intensity from the objects, excuse me. That's just how bright the object is where you're standing. One over the F number squared. And then we've got a one over four pi that just came from the fact that the lens is circular. And then this is really the object, object's apparent size. I've thrown a lot at you, so ask me some questions. Is the object's apparent size, I guess, would you technically get that information from like the resolution of your LCD screen? Um, no, the object's apparent angular, the object's angular size is just how big it looks to anyone far away from it is what I mean by that. Oh, okay. Sorry. I meant, uh, I meant to say like pixel size. Oh yeah. Yeah. The pixel size. Now, yeah. of course you have to be a little bit careful. If somebody says you've got, 
this many mega megapixels over this many square centimeters. There is the problem that um, there will be some space between the pixels. And how significant that space is depends on the camera architecture. Um, if it were, if it were a camera optimized for low signals, I would assume that they minimize that gap between pixels. If it were a camera optimized for speed, I know that in some designs, they um, cram a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of extra circuitry on there. So if it were optimized for speed, I wouldn't assume that it's got extra circuitry on there, but the first thing I would do is ask someone, hey, how is this configured? You know, Can I assume that 80% of my area is light sensing, that 90%, 70%, what's, what's the figure here? But it's, if it was anything that was configured, if it was anything where they put more, where the electronics were a big deal, where it was a major selling point, the electronic capabilities, not just the light collection efficiency, but any other, anything, if anything other than collection efficiency was what they were advertising, the first question I would ask is, how much of that area is light sensitive? And you know, certainly it's gonna be well above 50%, usually well above 70. How much above? Ask, it's gonna depend on things. Yeah, that's, but that's pretty big though, if it's only like 50% detecting it, as far as like the calculation would be concerned, right? For pixel size, okay. Other questions? Yeah, um, we're still trying to answer if uh, making a lens bigger is going to give us a better resolution, right? Yep. Okay. Um, and then my other question is from the first line of power on pixel that you wrote down is just intensity and focal plane times A squared to the second line. You just group things differently to make them look like something else, right? Just to interpret. Okay. I want to separate out the fact that, look, this is how much light we're getting when we stand this far away. So are you getting at the fact that uh, power per pixel is or is correlated to um, resolution? No, power per pixel, um, power per pixel depends on the F number. So what I'm saying is that if I've got two cameras that use the same sensor technology, meaning that they've got the same A squared, then I don't necessarily care about the diameter of the lens. I care about this because this will determine if, if, that, if, I've got, if they're using the same sensor technology, then they're using the same pixel of the same size, the same electronics, the same material with the same light detection efficiency, same light absorption efficiency and everything. All I really care about is, well, how much signal is getting onto each of those pixels, okay? And if I use a really wide uh, lens, but it also has a longer focal length, and that's usually the case, and that's usually the case because in everything you've done in ZMAX so far, what happens if you just make, if you fix a lens's radii of curvature, you know, this side has this curvature, that side has that curvature, and then you make the aperture wider. Does the image quality get better or worse? As you make the aperture wider, does the focusing get better or worse? Better. Um, it stays the same, doesn't it? You just have... Focusing stays the same in everything you've done in ZMAX. What happens when we widen an aperture? Haven't you noticed that things start to look uglier when we widen it? Yeah. Well, you have more light rays coming through, right? Yeah, and some of them are no longer getting focused. Things are starting to look uglier, right? Instead of having some nice sharp little point, everything just got smeared out. Oh, right, yeah. Light's not getting focused very well. So if you want a lens, if you really want to collect more light, 
without sacrificing quality. Sometimes you can sacrifice quality because the resolution is already so sharp that losing a little bit won't hurt what you're trying to do. Great. But simply widening your aperture in and of itself will involve a quality trade-off. It might be a perfectly acceptable trade-off given what regime you're working in, but it's a trade-off. And if you can't accept that, then the only way to collect more light is to get a wider lens and then you have a longer focal length. But that ratio of focal length to diameter stays the same. So you, by getting the wider lens, you haven't actually sent more light to each pixel. Now here are some things you do accomplish by getting a wider lens with a longer focal length. If you get a lens with a longer focal length, well, why is F tan theta, right? If I have a longer focal length, I'm photographing a distant person, that distant person looks taller, which means I can make them out. I can figure out what's going on. So if I'm a journalist or a spy, or I'm just some hobbyist in the woods and I wanna take a picture of something that's kind of far away because I can't hike to be right next to it. Then I want a lens with a long focal length because with that longer focal length, I will be able to um, magnify the picture of whatever thing I'm looking at that's really distant, okay? That's a very good reason to get a bigger lens, to magnify the picture of whatever's distant. That's a great reason to do it. A not so great reason is, hey, it's wider. I'm going to get better signal to noise because I'm going to get more signal on each pixel. No, you won't. If it's um, wider, go ahead. Yeah, just thinking about uh, how we're trying to link more light to how it affects resolution. Wouldn't, um, let's say those pixels like, if, it, if we're concentrating more intensity, wouldn't they kind of sort of interfere with each other in a way? And then that's why like, I, I, I hinge a lot of my knowledge to like photography. So like, if we usually uh, take in more light through our, a larger aperture, like you said, it, it does create sort of a like, very a smeared, almost uh, blinding image. And it's kind of hard to distinctify or distinguish different um, subjects in the image. If you take in more light, if you widen, if you if you are working with the same lens throughout, if you just widen your aperture stop, haven't changed lenses, haven't swapped out lenses, you just widen your aperture stop. Yes, you can get you can oversaturate because you're getting more light. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm saying, what if I swap out one lens for another? If I swap out one lens for another, will I get better signal to noise? No. If I take the lens I have and I widen the aperture stop, same focal length as before, just wider aperture, I am changing the ratio of D over F. And when I change the ratio of D over F, I will absolutely get more light I will get better signal to noise, okay? But if I um, swap out the lens, this comes, from, this comes from really two things. Some people, um, scientists worry more than, than artists about the, the term signal to noise. But when people were, when digital cameras first became big, they kept shrinking the pixels. And they would say, hey, more megapixels. Well, yeah, because you're shrinking the pixels, which means that you're making A squared smaller, less light per pixel. More pixels, each pixel is smaller. It could potentially, depending on the resolution of the lens, it could potentially reveal a finer detail, but you're also getting less light on it. That could be a trade-off. So smaller pixels, if some, smaller pixels do not automatically mean better detail if there's less signal on each pixel. Anyway, we are at 650. Anyone who wants to keep asking questions, I'm happy to take them. If you wanna discuss more of this, I can 
tell a story about something that people figured out for actually getting more signal by having only one photon per pixel. And what that means, it's a, it's a really weird trick that only works for a special thing, but we're not gonna cover anything more that will be on an assignment. If you need to go, go. If you wanna ask, ask. Um, sorry, just to reiterate what we we're basically discussing, we we're comparing the widening of an aperture of whatever lens versus changing, swapping it for a larger lens, correct? A lens that has a wider diameter and a commensurately longer focal length. I'm saying that that ratio of diameter- And longer, okay, yeah, the ratio. That ratio matters a lot. That's what I'm saying. Uh, is F number and F stop the same? Yeah. Okay. F stop is the word that the photographers use. F number is the word that the engineers use, but yeah. Okay, okay. Now somebody might say, well, technically the F number is a property of the lens itself. The lens has this diameter and the F stop, you could always make it behave like a lens with a smaller F number by narrowing or larger F number, excuse me, by narrowing the stop. But you know, as far as what goes into the calculation, it amounts to the same thing. Okay. I had, um, I have a, I guess a clarification question or some sort of question, but when we're talking about leaving the aperture size the same, but switching out a bigger lens, then that bigger no, lens- no, 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 We're not making the aperture size the same if we switch out to a bigger lens. Oh, okay, never mind then. Swapping to a different lens definitely changes the dimensions of the lens, that's the point. That's the point of what we're discussing. Wait, can you say that again? Swapping out the lens changes the the. You swap the to, I mean, well, well, describe what you thought we were talking about. Let, let me let me let me just hear the question. I should have. Um. It. Well, I was thinking if we have the same aperture size, but we switch out to a bigger, bigger lens. Than in what sense? Uh, bigger radius. That is the aperture. Well, I mean, okay, you can always get a bigger lens, but then put something in front of it so that the actual area that's letting the light through is still the same. Um, for light collection purposes, I'm not sure what that would get you. On the other hand, if it also had a longer focal length, well, now the size of the image that Y equals F tan theta, that's going to get bigger. That would be a reason to stick with the same aperture, but use a bigger lens that also has a longer focal length. Oh, because okay. You can imagine a lens that looks like this and here, I'll try to do something. Okay, so we can imagine this scenario um, versus this scenario. Okay, um, they this one has a shorter focal length. And a smaller diameter. All right, this one has a longer focal length and a larger diameter, okay? Same F number. Now, if you were, these have the same F number, but we could always take this lens and then put something in front of it. That's the aperture stop on a camera. That's the thing where you basically turn a little knob 
and it will make the, uh, it'll block out part of the light. All right. Now you've got the same aperture diameter, longer focal length. Why you would want that smaller aperture diameter? Well, I mean, you're not gonna be as worried about depth of field if you're looking at something far away. I'm not really sure why you would want it, but be, maybe because the, the sun came out and everything's bright and you don't wanna oversaturate your detector, but you do want to have that longer focal length so that you can uh, magnify something. I mean, I'm not a photographer. I just know the science behind it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think those are all my questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have questions? If you don't have questions, you're free to go. Uh, I don't really know what to ask. I think I'm just still trying to um, understand the example you mentioned about um, pixels. What about them? Um, so, I guess like uh, that, like I'm looking at that drawing, you know, with the large square and the smaller squares. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm just trying to uh, uh, think about, you know, why intensity, I guess, per pixel would matter. Sort of like, I guess, the big question you, 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 you set as basically the header of this section of the lesson. So the, because a small signal is more affected by noise in the electronics usually. Larger signals are usually not as affected by noise in the electronics. All right, so if we replaced this thing with- uh, Sorry, if I could ask you to pause for a second. Sure. So, so small, smaller signals are more susceptible- To noise. Um, so smaller signals usually mean like um, less light. Less light per okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, try to listen to something faint and any sort of scratchiness. If you're listening to something faint through some bad earphones, you know any sort of scratchiness will matter. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll you'll hear all of the scratchiness, the noise, the whatever problems in there you'll notice the scratchiness, that's the noise, okay? And that noise is significant enough to stand out relative to your music because you've turned your music down really low. You turn your music up and usually you don't notice the scratchiness as much anymore. Mm, yeah. That's a good example. And so when people said, hey, we're going to take the same area but pack more pixels into it. Well, okay, there's two reasons why this isn't all it's cracked up to be. One is that your signal to noise could get worse. Your signal to noise ratio could get worse. At low signal to noise ratios, you've got a problem. The other reason is that what if all that a human eye could perceive. What if these were already at about the limit of what a human eye could perceive? Okay, these are already smaller than what a human eye could perceive. Then, I mean, yes, technically there's some choppiness that might be just barely noticeable. But let's say it's right at the edge of, it's barely, if, it, if it's noticeable, it's only ever so slightly noticeable. Well, now you take it down below the edge of it, you haven't exactly gotten much improvement. Some people would be willing to spend the money for that improvement, but once it's below noticeable, nobody should be spending the money for that improvement. So those are the two problems. Those are the two reasons why smaller pixels or more megapixels aren't always what they're cracked up to be. 
Now, if they give you a wider field of view, you know, they don't change, they don't make the pixels smaller. They just spread them out over a larger area. That could be great. You know, if you've got a wide angle lens, that could be great. But I'm trying to say it's a subtle issue. You have to ask for what purpose? What am I worried about? Am I worried about resolution? Am I worried about signal to noise? Am I worried about field of view? Um, sorry, I just want to understand the technical terms. So I know resolution sort of to be uh, like, uh, well, I have a thing highlighted. It's like how well you can, let's say, distinguish two pixels. I'm going to just use displays, I guess, as an now, example, well, it's, right? It's not necessarily that. It's two point sources. So let me first draw two over slightly overlapping. I'll draw a few different scenarios. OK, mm -hmm. so first scenario, I've got two peaks that are non-overlapping. These are resolvable. Mm -hmm. But if I were to move my objects closer together, if these were the images of two point objects, not resolvable anymore. Right? Yeah. Now, if my pixel size, so let's let's draw the scenario then that's just barely resolvable. And people will quibble over exactly what qualifies as barely resolvable, but something like about that. Okay, roughly like that. So if my pixel size were about what I could resolve, well, that's good. If my pixel size were bigger than that, now my image is gonna be noticeably choppy. My pixel size is bigger than what I can actually see what I can resolve. So I'm gonna notice the pixel size, it's choppy. That's not good. Then somebody comes along and says, hey, we'll sell you pixels this tiny. I can think of some specialized applications where I could make use of that, but for most, these, these are specialized scientific applications. For most artistic applications, it's probably overrated. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's actually a really um, helpful graphic. No problem. Um, so when it comes to sort of like, um, I want I I'm I just really want to make sure that I use technical terms correctly. Sure, so, um, I know that there there is sort of a, a limit as to, you know what human eyes can benefit when it comes to higher resolutions, right? Because uh -huh. after a certain point, we can't really tell the difference, I guess. Um, so you can you can make a similar sort of argument, let's say with um, sound, right? Or, you know, like high fidelity sound, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, so would they be like a similar, uh, what is it called? I don't know what the word for it, but is it is it basically it's similar, right? It's just you know, whatever our eyes can do and whatever our ears can do. So the 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 limitations of eyes and ears are very. The if you're asking, it depends on what are the thing. What are, let's talk about what are the things we could resolve. Okay, we could try to distinguish two different pitches. You know, two sounds that have slightly different frequencies. And I know so little about that that I'm not even going to guess what our resolution is, but that would have something to do with how, to what extent does the, do the physically vibrating things in the eardrum uh, change their response when you, or whatever the things are that measure those frequencies, how does their response change and how well do they cha transfer that to some noticeable change in the neural signal that goes out, okay? Mm -hmm. You could ask, well, what's the faintest sound we can hear? And that's a, that's a different issue. For the first issue, the question of what is the smallest difference in pitch we can determine, that would be like asking, what is the smallest difference in color that we can determine? 
Yeah, yeah. What is the faintest sound we can hear? That would be equivalent to what is the dimmest thing we could see in the dark? And then the question, what's the smallest thing we can see? The analogy to that would be, you know how you can sometimes tell if a noise is coming from the left or the right? Yeah. Okay, well, that would be analogous to what's the smallest thing we can see. And our spatial resolution of our ears is terrible compared to the spatial resolution of our eyes. The frequency resolution, given the range of musical instruments out there, my guess is that that frequency resolution is way better. On the other, we, we, well, I mean, just given the sheer range of frequencies that we can hear, I would like to think that's better. On the other hand, when I look at paint stores and how many shades of white they have, I don't really know how to compare the two frequency resolutions. I'd have to think about that. Um, in terms of the light intensity resolution versus the sound intensity resolution, what's like the, the limit of what we can see or hear? We'd wanna compare the dynamic range, the intensity ratio. And I'm almost certain that the dynamic range of the ear is better because the, the ear like from, from the threshold of pain to the threshold of detectability is like 12 orders of magnitude, 10 to the 12th, a million. Yeah. <laughs> for, yeah. So, for visible light, the ratio between what we can barely notice in the dark and what would damage our eyes is smaller. Basically the visible range, right? Well, let's see here, looking directly, I mean, 10 to the third watts per square meter. If I were to stare, well, when I look at things that are illuminated with 10 to the third watts per square meter, all that light has been diffused. If I were to stare at something that bright for more than a second, I would suffer eye damage. On the other hand, if I were to 10 to the third watts, let's see here, a joule is about, 10 to the 19 photons, how many photons can we barely resolve? I'm not sure. They may be comparable now that I think about it because I know that, I forget exactly how many photons people can just barely resolve, but it's pretty impressive. I know I've heard of people doing impressive things in experiments like that. So, Actually, maybe our eyes are better. I'd have to think about that. Yeah, okay. But um, again, the sun, not only I got to revise that a little bit because the sun, who says that the sun is um, the threshold of damage? It's above the threshold of damage. How far? I don't know. But still, it's got to be given this something with a few watts per square meter is no problem. I don't know, I'd really have to think about that. Okay, no worries. Um, I probably have more questions, but I kind of, I have to eat and, but I, I think one uh, one thing that you mentioned that I'm, I'm curious about, I, I guess maybe reading myself about is how you're saying that uh, comparing, um, the amount of like small pixels versus um, the field of view that we can spread them apart and um, how probably field of view is a little bit more favorable. Do you know where I could read more about that? So if you wanted to learn about extreme things done with pixels to increase the field of view, Google for gigapixel camera. I know there are some people at USC who make gigapixel cameras. Okay, uh, I'm I'm probably trying to think of more like a fundamental view, like um, like why why field of view would be hi sorry why field of view would be more uh, beneficial I suppose. Well, uh, field of view is beneficial because you can take in more in one image. I mean, someone. When I went to a presentation by the USC people making a gigapixel camera, the levels of zoom that they were able to achieve, because basically they just have a very big lens 
And you know the, the pixels that they were working with, I don't think were that much bigger than pixels on other common cameras. I could be wrong. Oh, but... yeah, yeah. So I remember that example you mentioned. OK, yeah. sorry, continue if, if there's anything else. So you know, they're just, they are spreading that light over a huge, huge number of pixels, even things coming in at very wide angles. Let's see here. I mean, a megapixel camera versus a gigapixel camera, it's going to be about 30 times as wide and 30 times as tall to be a thousand times as many pixels. So the range of angles that they're looking over is 30 times larger, right? So they can take in a whole lot more information at once. And then they can just zoom in. So they can zoom in on different parts of the image. I mean, in order to take this vast amount of information, and put it onto a screen, you know, they're they're losing a lot of resolution there because the screens don't have don't have gigapixel resolution. The projectors didn't. So then you could zoom in on on it, and you could zoom in like you know thirty times basically. Right. So there's just there's just a huge amount of information acquired at once. Mm, okay, I'm gonna have to think about that. That does sound interesting. Yeah. Because imagine having, being able to image, I guess, really small things to that level. It's not really small things, but, you know, I, I'd love to talk more, but I have to do some things soon too. And I know Julian has to ask a question. So why don't you oh, come I'm sorry. sometime? Yeah, no, no, that's good. Um, yeah, I'd like to eat dinner. <laughs> Thank okay. you. All right. Bye. Bye.